All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I see there's many of you that have come in. Welcome to the 17th edition of the much heralded online webinar from AOPA. 17. Don't get rusty version. Seven ways an instrument rating will make you a better pilot. We had like 50 ways, but we had to cut it down for an hour and I didn't want to make yeah. it this one anymore. So seven ways <laughs> is what we're getting. I appreciate uh, that, Pablo. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's what we do. So, uh, iterative. Yeah, that's right. All right, so let's talk about the slides here. So uh, the attendee panel on the right side of the go to uh, webinar. Thank you. There is uh, there's a panel. Everyone is muted. You can't change that. Uh, but if you want to ask questions, you can so by hitting the question uh, area on that right bar there. And then throughout this uh, webinar, we will be answering the questions. I will be answering them more specifically. Uh, you might get some other ones, but as we go, we'll answer. So we will answer them online, on air, in person uh, as we go. However, uh, some of them we might keep the QA, so, and we'll tell you if we do that, so bear with us, um, but uh, we'll keep that going. Um, today, we have me. I'm Pablo Morelia. I am Senior Director of Flight Training Technology. So for You Can Fly, I am anything to do with technology. Uh, that includes the things we do daily and includes some of the things we're doing soon, which first quarter of next year, I won't tell you it's a secret. We have an app coming out. It's mm, pretty cool. Can't wait. Uh, yeah, and we'll probably do an episode on that maybe at some point. I don't know, because it is for CFIs, it's for students, it's for anybody. So, uh, but stay tuned for that. I know I've tweaked it here for the last 17 episodes, but it's coming. Um, all right, uh, so the next, Chris. Hey everybody, it's Chris Moser, um, and in fact, I am helping Pablo work on that that app. And the, the really cool thing is, it's just in time for a few months after Christmas, so it's perfectly timed uh, for the market and flight training. Uh, anyway, I'm the senior director of flight training education. I work with CFIs in schools, uh, and I'm also uh, not only a CFI, but I'm an instrument instructor as well, which is one of the reasons that uh, I'll be talking about this topic today. And with us, we have a special guest from our Flying Clubs Initiative, Drew Myers. Drew, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your recent accomplishment. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, my name is Drew Myers. Like it says, I'm the manager of the Flying Clubs Initiative. I work with Steve Bateman to help form and maintain flying clubs all over the country. We have helped form over 160 flying clubs so far, and we're going strong. So we're very proud of that. And, um, I, yeah, my recent accomplishment is I just very recently got my instrument ticket the week before Thanksgiving. And um, it fit, it's fitting because my very first instrument flight with that new rating was in my flying club airplane. I flew from College Park, Maryland out to Shenandoah, Virginia. So that was a, a fun flight for sure. And uh, yeah, really happy to be here, guys. Thanks. Awesome. Well, cool. it's, it's good to have you here, Drew, from the much heralded flying club side of things. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so also behind the scenes, you'll hear a voice soon. His name is Steven Schroeder. He's a coordinator, for flight training initiative. Uh, Steven? Hey, hello, Steven. Hello, Steven. <laughs> and so he's going to be running our slides today. <laughs> Had a couple of technical issues, so he'll be running that. Okay, now, uh, as always, there are a couple of things we're gonna cover. Uh, one is wings credit. There is wings credit for this, and that's based on the email that you signed up with. Okay, so we've already gotten that question a couple of times. There is wings credit, and we'll cover that throughout. Uh, two, this will appear, uh, it is being recorded, so it will appear on AOPA's YouTube. It'll appear on, um, the AOPA.org website as well. You'll be able to find it from there and that'll take you to the other sites where it's also listed. Generally, it takes, what, about 24 hours, guys? I mean, because it's got to go through motion. Yeah, tomorrow, so tomorrow afternoon, probably. Yeah, so tomorrow afternoon, you should be able to get it. So don't fret. You will be able to see us again if you miss something. Also, one last thing is when we have videos, we have polls, sometimes there's issues with boxes staying up. Sometimes, sometimes not, and it's all all devices, all computers, all formats. So if you have that problem, try swiping, swipe up, swipe down, swipe left if you're on a tablet. If not, see if the window maybe fell behind something else. But uh, we get that question sometimes as well. So uh, so let's begin. Seven ways instrument rating makes you better. Chris. Hey, everybody. So we're excited to talk about these seven ways. And what I wanted to do is just start off the presentation with a, a little short intro video. And remember, guys, don't forget to unmute your microphones because when it comes on. But if Stephen, if we could roll that video and then we'll just we'll pause that here in a second. Let's go. Skills on an approach to minimum. 
So the You'll big be thing able here to that land at the end of nearly all your instrument approaches, but don't watch, ever assume don't worry about the that an approach so will always result in a landing. Poor visibility. Begin you every can't approach anything, with your mind already made up, ready to rating. execute the missed approach procedure. If the runway doesn't appear on time, really poor visibility. You'll runway. probably be able to see the go. runway well before you get there. But now and then, you'll need to follow the procedure all the way to the missed approach point. Either way, breaking out should be no surprise, and the pilot who has planned ahead will consider the landing as the next event in his sequence. As visual cues begin to appear, resist the temptation to make an immediate transition. Instead, consider what you see outside as just another instrument to be included in your scan. Cool, I think and you get the idea there. gradually so increase the amount of time and spent stop looking... Stop the video. And then bring it on back. And so the big thing there was I just wanted to show again just that, that sort of idea of what you're able to do as an instrument pilot is come out of the cloud, the cloud deck, and all of a sudden, boom, the runway's right there. And I don't know, Drew, you can tell me, I know the first time that I've done that, or I did that coming out, and like even whether taking the hood off or breaking out, it was pretty cool. In fact, it's still cool when you break out, like, boom, there's the runway. That's amazing. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough in my training to get some actual experience, and and we shot a, a, a RNAV approach down to pretty close to minimums, not not quite, but it was it's it's a, a very very relieving and exciting feeling to see to break out and see the runway environment and stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, it's it's really rewarding too to see it happen. All right, let's go to the next slide, Stephen. So what we're going to do is roll our poll here, and we'd like to get an idea of uh, just our audience. How many in our audience have an instrument rating or maybe are working on it or haven't even started yet, um, which is totally okay. So we're going to roll that poll, and we're going to see. Um, I know, Pablo, that you've been uh, looking at starting your instrument rating. That was something that you're interested in doing. You want any, Anything you want to say about yeah. that? Or? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to start with the, how disappointed it was to start because I started my training on March 11th with my first class, uh, lesson, and then I drove, I drove home on March 13th. Haven't flown since. <laughs> uh, bad luck. However, yes, I wanted yeah, to start. So. Uh, as ma as many of you know, I do a lot of long distance trips, and uh, it would be nice to have. I definitely think it'll make me a better pilot too. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's, it's certainly useful, I would think, as well for those long trips, because you had. I mean, it was wasn't that long ago that webinar you talked about where you got your you ended up running into some not so great weather and had to just sit down and wait for a while. The instrument rating would have been really useful there. It, it's super useful, super, especially on the way out. On the way back, there's too much of a storm. But yeah, I mean, you know, just in general, right? Even when I'm over the top VFR, you know, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, when's that layer? I know the layer's not there <laughs> after, you know, but it's still there. It's I've definitely been there. I've definitely been there. <laughs> it gets stuck, stinks. All right, did let's you get the written done yet? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Pablo, did you get it written done? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's there. All right, let's go ahead. Yeah. I think with the poll looks pretty good. Let's see what our results are. Yeah. Look at that. So it looks like the vast majority of our audience, which is perfect for this one, is not yet instrument rated. Um, and then we've got a few folks on here that are uh, instrument rated, not current, and then a few that are current. So it's it's a pretty good mix. And then I love the person that said, I'm so instrument, I never look outside. That's always <laughs> a great idea. I, I hope I, I know you're just kidding. Yeah, so don't do that. But uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's go ahead and get to the, the slide again there. And... Go to the next one for me, Stephen. Thank you. So our number one reason, our number one way that an instrument rating makes you a better pilot, um, and I know that Drew will chime in here about this too, is it's all about precision. And one of the things that I wanted to show here was this is an example of a uh, aircraft power profile or pitch and power profile. This is something that I do, I know with my instrument students, and I learned it, um, it was after my instrument rating I learned how to do this, but with my instrument students, one of the first things we do is we go and figure out whether we're practicing in the sim or in the airplane. We do it for both. We figure out this whole thing. And notice what you do is you break down all of your flying into six settings, basically. And this is for a Piper Seminole. You can do this for a 172, obviously, with a fixed pitch prop. There's no manifold, but you got climb, cruise and holding, cruise descent, approach level, approach descent, um, and then non-precision descent. So you've got one for like doing an ILS versus one for doing a, like a VOR or a GPS approach. Um, and this makes a huge difference because now instead of having to sit there and figure out how do I maintain whatever my approach speed is, in the case of a Seminole here, we've got it at 100, 
120, it's boom. You just know exactly, like in a 172, it's 90 knots. And I know this power setting, this pitch gives it to me. It simplifies your flying, which actually can be used in VFR. What do you think about that, Drew? Did you find that useful? Or did you do that during yours? Oh, yeah. And, and that was actually one of the very first questions my DPE asked me on the check ride was, okay, so if you're flying an approach, 500 feet per minute descent, 90 knots, what RPM are you using? I, I did it in a Cessna 172 with a fixed pitch prop, obviously. So, you know, it's just like, well, I'm glad I, I did those power tables and knew knew what to expect. And, and also, too, I'd like to point out that just when you're in that training mindset, you kind of strive for precision and accuracy. Um, after one of my first instrument lessons, my instructor, Keith, was like, hey, by the way, your your taxiing is all over the place. Like, you're not staying on center line. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> I, you know, it's, I've, been, I've been a pilot for five years, so I guess I I got sloppy in that time. And you know, it, it's a good way to kind of bring you back and get you in that more precise mindset. Um, and in on fact, one thing that I'll, I'll – go ahead, Pablo. I was going to say, just blame it on the plane. That's what I would have done. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I flew with, there's something wrong with this. Not only I fly something better. Rudders, rudders off. Yeah. You said, my club airplane's so much better than this one. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the the one thing that I'll mention too is that uh, I've seen it, I know during my own instrument rating, and I know that it happens to pretty much everybody when you're teaching them their instruments, is one thing weird that happens is like while you're working on instruments and you're building this precision, precision because you have to be exact on your altitude and headed control, so it helps you to really tighten tolerances uh, in the same way of being able to fly a particular descent rate or climb rate, your landings just go to garbage. They just become horrible. I don't know if you have that experience too, Drew. Yeah, it's it's almost like an yeah. afterthought. Just like the the act of landing the plane is such an afterthought that you you're just not mentally there, you know. And I think part of it, what happens too, is that we spend like we're so used to during the private or if even during your commercial, focused on outside, and you're you're used to that outside references on the instrument. You're just focused inside, and all of a sudden you have to transition back to outside. So it's very common. So just if you are working on your instrument rating and that happens, just know that that is completely normal. Uh, and in fact, what I've started doing, I'm working with somebody right now, and we've made a point of let's make sure we do a couple landings every lesson just so we can try to help prevent that from happening um, when we come in. So, all right, cool. Let's go to the next slide, Stephen. So our number two reason or number two way that it makes us a better pilot overall is notice the difference in term here. We normally talk about spatial disorientation, but this slide I'm talking about spatial orientation. And the, the amazing thing that happens during your instrument rating is that you have to be able, rather than, because you can't see outside, you don't know where you are, you have to mentally know where you are in relation to the airport. Now, admittedly, today with things like ForeFlight and um, other EFBs and your GPS screens and everything that we're seeing in a lot of the GA airplanes, it's easier, but still, through your instrument training, a good instructor is going to take a lot of that stuff away from you and make you use like a VOR or just the, the GPS without the map. Um, and you have to know where you are. And the big part of this is because you need to know where's the airport in case there was an emergency. What terrain am I over? Because you still have to think about in you know, an engine failure or something. And so am I over mountainous terrain right now? I'm over water. I'm over, um, you know, farmland or whatever. So it's a, a, at first, though, maybe, Drew, you can share your experience here, too, is when you first begin, though, and your instructor asks you that question, where are we right now? What's the, what's the kind of feeling you first get before you start to get the hang of it? Yeah, your, your eyes just dart all over the place and you're trying to think of like, all right, well, I know I'm going in this direction, but my wind windrips is doing this and it, it can get, it gets uh, overwhelming at first and it, it, it really comes down to staying ahead of the airplane and anticipating where you're going to be and, and also being able to cross check with different navigational resources like your VORs and your GPS and things like that for sure. No doubt. Because, and, and in um, fact... One, one thing real quick, uh, and someone, I think this is a good question before we get too far away from, but number one about your precision, uh, they said, how yeah. easily transferable is the skill from different airplane model to different model? Um, for instrument training, I assume they're asking, and actually it's very useful. The, the big key, because like, for example, um, in my uh, career so far, I'd gone from flying and teaching in 172s and Seminoles to flying like a Piper Lance and a Chieftain and a 99 and, and other kind of things like that. And I will say that the key that I found to making that work is getting those power settings. So for every airplane that I've ever flown, I literally have gone and made that my first goal was get that power setting figured out so I know this is the setting I'm going to use. And once I do that, notice how I had those six settings. It simplifies it down. So I have a lot less to worry about. And then, then after that, the scan and the actual instrument procedure stuff is the same. The only difference I would say that happens is, and then I don't know if you've experienced this yet, Drew, is, but when you switch to a faster airplane, everything happens a lot faster. So staying ahead of the airplane becomes more of a challenge, but Absolutely. you get used to that. 
and then the flip of that is then when you go back to a slower airplane, you're kind of like, now you can just totally relax. You're just like, why is this taking so long? I remember after flying the yeah. 99 and going back and flying a 172 again, I'm like, there's nothing to do in this airplane. It's, there's, <laughs> like, it's going so slow. Um, yeah. So you just, it's like that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And then I wanted to, you go ahead. Go ahead a lot of it, a lot of my training especially was focused on, you know, you're doing it in the 172, a very simple airplane, but making sure you have those basics down pat so that when you transfer up to a faster airplane, because Honestly, with the instrument flying, the assumption is you're going to move up to bigger and faster airplanes and more capable IFR platforms, right? Mm -hmm. So having the basics down, having the strong scan, being able to stay ahead of your navigation and your and all your systems is huge. So you, you kind of train from that from the start, or at least you should. And um, and I've I've been I've, I've unfortunately I get to fly a few different types of small GA airplanes, and I think my my flying in, in as a whole has become a little bit more precise just because of my instrument training. So I can I can certainly attest to it. Very cool. And so that's that's totally it. And I think that you, so again, to answer that question, I think it very much works. And um, and the one thing that Drew kind of mentioned earlier too, when he was making his comment on this number two slide is the VOR proficiency. You're going to get really good, like you'll understand VORs and how to interpret them way better. And in fact, I even found that the stuff that I learned being an instrument instructor, I started actually teaching some of that and some basics to my private pilot students to make the VOR not so mysterious. Because a lot of times folks uh, are not, um, it seems overwhelming or it's weird. And I know from my own private training, I didn't really get it until later. Um, and so it's, it does really, it's very helpful. And remember, it is our official backup to the GPS. As much as we use the yep. GPS, the VOR is our safety backup. And if you don't know how to use it, it's no good as a backup. It doesn't do you any good safety-wise. So make sure you take the time to learn it well. I yeah, did not mention ADF yet. here. Yeah, I did not mention ADF here because there are very few NDBs left. Not that it's not a cool skill. I I did learn how to do it, and it was really it's fun, but I just found that it's not something. I don't know. Did you do any NDB training during your instrument rating? No, I did not, but the, the topic did come up. I was asked about how VORs differ on my check, right? I was asked how VORs differ from NDBs and, and how they how the instruments interpret them and how you can how can you, you can use them for navigation. So they're they're still out there in the ether. You still have to have some knowledge of them. So don't don't I mean just like VORs, I had a kind of a passive attitude towards VORs before I started my instrument training, just because I, I would just go GPS direct all the way, you know? So it, it's definitely something that you want to have good good fluency in. Cool. Hey Chris, the and, chart on your precision yeah. slide uh, with the aircraft yes. and the fire map, is that something that you created? Is that something that's available to the public or how, how has that come about? Um, I actually found that from an old instrument book, uh, that's where I, I just like realized the concept or whatever. I suppose what we could do is uh, we could get a blank one to share with folks. Um, Steven, maybe you can help me with that. Is that something we could email all the attendees? Just because we don't have it as a handout on this one. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I can pull pull the mailing list to send that out to everybody. Okay, so we'll see if we can do that. So I can I can uh, get a blank version of that, uh, and then we can just email out to everybody who may want it. So um, rather, than, yeah, so that's what we'll do. We'll try to remember to do that after the the webinar here today. Or yeah, that'll be a lot of fun to go out and and create one of those for your airplane. That that would be yeah. a really good practice. And I'll just send it as like a PDF and then make as many copies as you want and and do it. It's very very useful and it's nothing that I it's nothing like that's, you know. Uh, original from AOPA. I found that elsewhere and it's just very, very useful. All right, let's go to the next slide here, Stephen. So Radio Master, now we know that, remember this is the don't get rusty seminar. We know that a lot of folks that, you know, when we're not flying as much or whatever, they get rusty on radios. I know that I did because I was rusty for a while. Um, getting your instrument rating is going to increase your Radio Mastery beyond your wildest imagination because you're going to get so much more confident talking to ATC because you're going to be dealing with all levels, center, approach, uh, going into Bravo airports, all that kind of stuff. So you're going to find yourself that it's going to get much easier. And one of the reasons for that is that, is that second bullet that I've got there, which is clearances, clearances, clearances. Here's the thing, my one tip that I want to give, because it took me, like it didn't occur to me for a few years later, but what I realized was from my instrument training, I learned the format that ATC always gives you your clearance in. And if you pay attention, every clearance you get, whether it's a taxi clearance, a takeoff clearance, they all come in the same order and it helps you to anticipate it. So you're gonna get way better and your VFR clearances are gonna sound so much easier when you get used to an instrument clearance. Do you find, I see you're nodding your head there, Drew, do you find something similar experience or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we fly around the DC SFRA, so we do a lot of talking on the radio anyway, but I found when I got my, got to my instrument training and flying instruments, 
I found that I was doing a, a much better active listener and I was really thinking about what ATC was telling me and how that applied to my flight. Whereas before you were kind of a little bit more passive. Um, so I definitely, definitely thinking about what they're saying and does that make sense for what I'm trying to do? Can I do that? Is that reasonable? You know, all that stuff, it, it really helps. And you talk about uh, the the better at asking for help there at the bottom of the slide. I mean, yeah, it, it the, the, the teamwork mentality between you and the air traffic controllers that you're working with, it's way more uh, uh, like evident when you're an instrument flying. And, and folks, if you didn't pick it up too, like Drew, uh, he's flying out of College Park Airport. I know one person I saw in the comments knows where that is. He's flying out of that. If you know that the Washington DC has got that special flight rules area, he's flying right out of the middle of that. And the College Park is just, is it, it's not one of the three, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's one of the three. three. It's, it's inside the, the freeze of the flight restricted zone. Yeah. Yep. So he's so. dealing with ATC a lot. And so he, even he's telling you someone who's flown for five years out of that is saying that instrument rating helped him be better on the radio. So it just gives you an idea of the level that it'll raise you to us. It really is useful. And I know for me, when I fly um, with somebody who's instrument rated versus not um, and working with them, it definitely shows in your VFR flying. And the thing too, is that like that fear of, or the nervousness about maybe getting a clearance through the Bravo or talking to approach control or whatever, it goes away, your confidence goes up and you actually are able to get a lot more out of them because they know you can handle yourself in the radio and you're not gonna be blocking up the airway or um, you know, they just know that they figure you can handle it. And just, it's the more professional you sound, the better you sound, the more you're gonna get out of ATC. Mm -hmm. um, and which helps you get help. So, all right, yeah. let's go to that next slide, number four. I think it's actually the next one might be a poll. It is. So how comfortable are you at flying at night? If we can roll that poll, Stephen. So obviously what we're going to be coming up with here is talking about a little bit about night flying because it's pretty applicable. What do you guys think, um, Pablo or, or yeah. Drew? What do you think? How comfortable are you guys yeah. flying at night? Well, I know what I would go with. I love it. I would actually probably be on the no joke prefer. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The other way. No big deal. It's just like a day daytime flight for me. I love it. There was one time I was scared, uh, but or getting close to being scared, being over the clouds over what, central Ohio at nighttime with no moon. And I was yeah. like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm probably in the, okay. uh, the second one there. Um, it, it's pretty, but it definitely takes extra flying. And to that point, Pablo, I, I always look at what the moon phase is before I'm doing like a long cross country away from the DC area where it's gonna be more sparsely populated. I wanna be able to at least see the outline of some of the some of the ground features and stuff because it can get real disorienting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's and it, I know for me, it was like when I was flying uh, professionally too. I did a lot of night flying, and the one thing that I didn't like was flying over the mountains at night, which I had to do for my job. But that was always uh, worrisome because it's like you know, unlike in the daytime, you can't see what's down below you or whatever. So uh, definitely takes more planning. It's, it's kind of where I fall too, as much as I've done it. Um, always want to think extra because because of the fact I, I want i like to know where i'm going to land if something were to happen so nice. all right but if you don't know <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's, that's the, i guess that's that idea of you know if you could turn the landing light on if you don't like what you see turn it back off so um <laughs> hey so so someone asked if you're going to talk about craft c-r-a-f-t yeah um i wasn't going to mention that specifically but we can certainly i could talk about that towards the end uh the i, I imagine that that person probably is already instrument rated if they know craft uh, it is very useful, and it's actually something that's in our Rusty Pilots course. We we break that out as a, a useful way because when I talked about the clearances coming in a particular order, craft is the way that that happens. I noticed we got a pretty good spread here on the um, poll. Um, so we got yeah. overall, we got folks mainly in there, and that it takes the extra planning or just being more cautious. And then if you know a number there saying they just prefer not to fly in the dark, which is completely understandable. And then we have our Pablos there at the no big deal. It's just like a day <laughs> flight, so it all depends I mean, on what you get used to. The airplane doesn't have a dark out. <laughs> that's right it's just daytime with a dark sky what the heck? exactly just you know whatever you can't what? see whatever it's all good <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go ahead to the next slide there steven here we go there we go all right so this this video that uh steven's about to roll is and let me just set it up before you do roll it steven is this is a video that i made in x plane and the reason that i made this video is i was uh i was as an instructor i was getting ready to teach something but this is something that i used to do when i was flying out in arizona i used to go to this airport at night all the time and it, it's like well just check it out and you'll see what i'm talking about why you'll be able to tell part way through the video and don't forget to unmute don't forget to unmute guys um part way through the video we're starting out at nighttime with the flying and then we're going to see i will flip it part way through to daytime in the sim which is really useful and we'll just get a, a good view of this airport
You can see the runway there lit up, kind of coming in, and it just muted again, guys, in case you need to unmute. You can kind of see the Pappy. There's the beacon there on the off the left. Now I pause it and I turn it to oh daytime. Turn the lights on, Chris. Turn the lights on. Here it comes. We're going to noon. What are we going to see here? What's going to happen? Oh and you Whoa. might notice there's a little bit of terrain off to the left there. It's actually <laughs> off to the east. Um, and so this is Lake Havasu, Arizona. And um, this used to freak me out because I used to fly in the daytime there. And so when I was coming in at night, I knew not only was that terrain off to the east, but which you can't really tell from the sim as much, is there was a hill also right there on the approach. And if you were on glide path, you were not that far above the hill. I mean, you were safe, but that's why I used to fly it a little high because it used to freak me out. So let's go to the next video. And so we'll talk a little bit about what an instrument rating can do to help you with that. Because that was like I talked about. I used to fly in the mountains at night during that, doing that job. and and. Uh, it used to freak me out sometimes. So biggest thing is I would say that number four here is safer night flying. It's, you, you're better in low visibility because you're able to, you're used to being on the instruments. You're used to being what that's like. Uh, it can help you deal with disorientation. Um, I'm, I got one example. And I know Drew's got another one too. And I think Pablo, you might even have had one. I know for me, I was out working with a student when I was instructing in Arizona. We were out over the desert south of Phoenix at night. We had turned away from Phoenix doing a practicing holds. And there was a road that had cars on it that was sort of, sort of like an angle. And when we turned that outbound, I was the one looking outside because my student was under the hood. And immediately I was disoriented. It was that fast. It wasn't like a gradual thing. It was immediately, I didn't know, I thought we were level but it felt like we were turning. I, I didn't know what was going on and I had to go over to the instruments and just, I had to sit there and focus on the attitude indicator and the turn coordinator just to convince myself that we were okay. It was just that fast. It was overwhelming feeling and it took a few seconds um, and then eventually I was able to work through it. I know Drew, you had an example like that too? Yeah, um, it wasn't a real airplane, it was in a Redbird, but we were we were doing uh, just some a standard instrument approach and my instructor actually failed the uh, attitude indicator and the HSI. So, but he didn't fail the vacuum. So in my scan, I would check the vacuum system to make sure I was still had vacuum. And so that, I, I, I thought everything was just dandy, but I got into that so that, as you know, with a, with a gyro, as it, as it spools down, it kind of mm -hmm. slumps over to the side. So, you know, just happy as a clam, just follow that thing right in and entered into a perfect graveyard spiral. And I didn't catch it in time. And that, and I learned from that, that you need to have a good scan. You need to be cross-checking with your with your turn coordinator and, and your compass and everything just to make sure you're not it, getting yourself into a situation like that so that was a, a real eye-opener and i'm happy it happened in a simulator not the real airplane <laughs> yeah no kidding that's a good lesson to learn from this them too did you have one pablo you wanted to share or yeah that thing uh, you were actually no. just mentioned when you were flying over that nighttime with no moon right it was that that so that's, when it happened well yeah and so because i've made that trip many times and it's three and a half, four and a half hours, five and a half, depending on winds and storms. And if I'm going straight line or one of these and yeah. And, and that one time it was just a beautiful night. I was at like 9,500 and yeah, it was, uh, I don't remember clouds at that point there, but that one night, man, I, I knew it would clear up leaving Ohio into Pennsylvania. And so I had this, just a solid deck under me and everything was great. I had no worries. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I have worries. I'm like, what if the clouds don't disappear? What's right. the, what am I going to And it was like, relax, dude. You did your weather plan and you know it's okay. You know, you're still like, <laughs> you know, finger, it's, finger on the autopilot. It's one, it's one thing to see the forecast, though. It's a whole other thing of when you're above yeah. it, you're like, I know that's what they said, but I just don't see it. I know. It always takes Listen, longer yeah. than you think it will or want it to. I was, I was about an hour and a half still out, hour 40, and I'm just like, and of course, that's you know, even though it's, it's just, like 40 minutes from being away, I'm still like, okay, anytime now. It's yeah. just like flying over water. That's when the engine starts running rough, or it seems to. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that I wanted to mention with Drew's situation too, where he talked about, and I imagine you picked this up, and and I don't know if you've heard of this one before, Drew, but in that situation of of you know making sure you're checking the vacuum, if you have a vacuum system with the attitude indicator and the heading indicator, there is an amazing thing. So if you go into whether you're going into instrument rating, you're thinking about it, remember the term I'm about to say, which is called the inverted V scan inverted v-scan um, and in fact that is uh, we have an article on aopa.org that it's part of uh, it's it's listed it's like an auto article from the maybe the mid 2000s and uh, it is basically where you scan the attitude indicator you scan the turn coordinator and you scan the vsi and normally you think i don't look at the vsi that much but i found that when i scan those once things are established it's amazing and you're checking 
checking all three systems against one another. You're checking the vacuum on the attitude, you're checking the electric system on the turn coordinator, and you're checking the pedostatic with the VSI. If you get things stabilized and go to that inverted V, you will catch things like altitude deviations and other things very, very quickly. You'll catch any kind of things, and you'll very quickly catch if one of those things is not agreeing, you know, oh, that's my vacuum that's gone, or my electric is gone, or my pedostatic's got something wrong, because they won't agree anymore. So it's a yeah. great, great tip, and I'd heard about it before. I only tried it like with like maybe a year or two ago, uh, and when I did, I was like, holy cow, this is the most amazing thing I've ever done. It really is a powerful tool. So, yeah, I, so I, I learned... Go ahead, sorry. No, no go ahead. I, I learned about that. Um, you, you, you think you have a scan. You, you have something that works for you. You can control the aircraft with the way that... However you decide to look at those instruments. Mm -hmm. Well, when things go wrong or if you get stressed or if you're maybe not flying as much as you probably should be, I, I think having a, a disciplined, uh, systematic scan on your instruments is going to really help you out a lot. And uh, speaking as a newer pilot, I mean, I, I don't have a ton of experience. I've, I've never been rusty as an instrument pilot, but I can just tell that having a, a set way that you view those instruments and interpret them can really help. Um, it makes it like more, more of an afterthought. It's not, it doesn't take as much mental bandwidth. Absolutely. And so make sure that that you um, learn about those types of scans if you get into this. And in fact, hold on, I just happen to have here Rod Machado's Instrument Pilot Handbook, brought to you by, oh, but anyway, in here, any good book, like the Instrument Flying Handbook from the FAA or, or Rod Machado's book, which I, I just happen to have here, I'll, I need to figure out where to put that away. Um, <laughs> but they'll, they'll describe those types of scans. So check out, and like I said, any good instrument textbook will um, uh, and show that. Let's go to the next slide. Well, one you, of the things I want to say- Let me ask you uh, two things real quick. Uh, one is, what's your thought on the autopilot? Because someone asked that, and it's true. I've, because of situations like that, and some of the other ones I've done, I've I've learned to really, really, because I like to hand fly, right? But that autopilot in those situations bring a sense of calm of saying, at worst, I'm going to Canada, but I'm, my wings are level. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, my wings are level, and I'm going to Canada. I don't care. Or, or, you know, West Virginia, who cares, right? Uh, but either way, I might not Same be going thing. to my final destination, but my wings are level. How do you feel about that? I, I'm not saying as a, a, a reliance on it, but as a, a certain sense of maybe safety or maybe last ditch, you know, you're in the clouds and inadvertent IMC and you're like, all right, I got to keep these wings level. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, the, and in fact, I was literally just talking to the student that I'm working with about that just this past week. The thing that I would tell you is absolutely, you need to know how to use your autopilot. You need to know all the features of it, how to, you know, have it, if it's got its approach capable, how to do that. Because when you're in, especially whether going down to minimums or you're getting busy, you're trying to brief an approach, using that autopilot is going to reduce your workload so you can stay safer. But the caveat is you need to regularly practice your hand flying. So for me, like I, like when I was flying, um, you know, every day as a, as a professional pilot, I used to hand fly all the time. I had an autopilot in most of the planes that I would fly and I would use it when I got busy. Like there was paperwork that I would have to fill out on engine performance as part of like when we leveled off a cruise. And so I would turn the autopilot on and do that. Or if I had to brief an approach, I would flip it on. But I would spend most of my time hand flying because I was, I was purposely trying to maintain my scan. I didn't want to get rusty. So it's definitely a balance where you want to use it when you need it, but you've got to maintain proficiency so that if things go wrong or if it doesn't work, you still can fly safely. And that's probably the biggest thing that we see um, in instrument training or people coming back for an IPC is that they can fly with an autopilot and you take it away from them, which you know I'm gonna do if like any instructor's gonna take it away from you and then they can't control the airplane anymore. And what happens is they depend on it so much that they've let, them, let their scan and their skills atrophy. And that's what you wanna avoid. So absolutely know how to use it and use it for safety, but practice regularly, not without it, hand flying it, because that's what's going to keep you safe when things go wrong. So also, can you, can you just review the um, the inverted V again, please? Sure. We had a question about that. So one number one thing is if you just look up inverted V scan, uh, and in fact the article um, you can if you want to write it down and maybe we can throw it in the chat there is uh, uh, Ralph Butcher. He talks about it. He wrote a couple of articles about instrument scan. Ralph Butcher, that's B-U-T-C-H-E-R. He wrote about instrument scans on AOPA.org. There's some articles there uh, that he wrote. And in there, he talks about the inverted V. And he talks, he has like three different ones all around the same time. And the inverted V, again, if you look it up, you'll find it. It's it's a very common thing, but it's basically you're scanning the attitude indicator, the um, turn coordinator, and the VSI, those three things, because you're cross-checking all three. And the time that you use it, 
is once you're already established, you're established in cruise, you're established in a climb, whatever it may be, and then you sort of scan that. And if you see a deviation, then you go back to your kind of primary supporting or pitch and power uh, type of deal after that. Um, and in fact, he makes a really good analogy. He says that the attitude indicator is a trap door. And when I first read that, I was like, a trap door. And what he says is, have you read this article before, Drew? Or, um, no, that, that makes perfect sense. He says that the reason it's a trap door, at first I thought he was saying it's bad to look at it. He actually says the opposite. He says, if you don't give it enough attention, you're going to fall through a trap door. So he says the attitude indicator is very, very important in learning how to scan it. And of course, part of your instrument training is you'll learn how to fly it without it um, as partial panel. But the attitude indicator is an amazingly useful tool. And when things start to go awry, as long as it's working correctly, my scan goes right back to it. So hopefully that answers those questions. Um, and like I said, Ralph Butcher articles, in, 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 I don't know if it says inverted V in it, but if you look up Ralph Butcher instrument or AOPA instrument flying, look for those articles by him. Those are the ones. So that I did. About. I did put um, a link to it. Uh, it's called Instructor Report, Altitude Flying and the Inverted V. It's in Flight Training Magazine, May 5th, 2016. Yes. And it's by Charles McDougall. I'm this, this one is. Uh, okay. But it says how you can revolutionize instrument flight. All of that is in the top part. So I did put a link to it <laughs> in the questions, and I sent it to everybody. Uh, perfect, I did perfect. Oh, so if you guys go to the questions, there's a link right there. And from there, I think just go to AOPA, and you'll see. I think there's three other ones about that. So. Yeah, and I know, like I said, the Ralph Butcher wrote some ones that was either late 90s or early 2000s, and he's got a couple that he wrote for us. So really good stuff. All right, let's go ahead. And so one of the things I wanted to show here was that you can use instrument approach procedures as a VFR pilot. So Stephen, if we could go ahead and click that next slide. So this gives you an example. This is that airport that I showed in the video where we saw at nighttime, and then we turned the lights on effectively, and all of a sudden there's terrain. So you can see that that approach that I was making is coming from the Northwest at Needles Airport there, and you're coming down and you're, there's the runway at the very end. Now, instrument approach plates, if you have not been taught how to use them, can be incredibly confusing and they may not make, no, they may not make any sense to you. Um, but if you go get some training, even as a VFR pilot, even, even if you're not getting your instrument rating, you can use these especially a simple one to help guide you on a night flight because now it's like I'm still looking out VFR I'm still looking for traffic but it gives me a course to fly and it gives me if you look at the uh, the right picture there it gives you altitudes like once I get to the VOR then I can I stay at 4,000 feet I can descend down to 3,500 up to a certain distance then down to 2540 and so on it will give you safe altitudes that you will not hit anything um, and so these can be really useful to help you make a, a more comfortable safe approach but my big emphasis here is do not try to do this on your own. Don't just try to go in and do it on your own. Go with an instructor, have them help you so you can understand the limitations, so you can understand how to read them properly and make sure you're interpreting things correctly. Um, but it's a, a really useful way to do, uh, to do night flying. Um, and in fact, if I can go ahead and click to the next slide, Stephen, and then I don't know if Drew or you guys, if you have yeah, anything you wanted to add, yeah. This just shows a, a bigger view. You can see the terrain even more and it shows the, the altitude or it shows some of the altitudes on here. And again, we're not gonna get into how to interpret a plate right now because that's a whole webinar in and of itself. But Drew, go yeah, ahead yeah. and what are you gonna share? Um, yeah, so the, this is an approach and also there are instrument departure procedures as well. And when I yes. when we flew back from Shenandoah, it, we, we showed up in the day, our, our business there took way longer than we thought. So we got caught by the night. and. And there are out there in the in Virginia, there's this huge mountain range. So knowing where those were, because it, it was just dark. It was a dark night last night or the, the night that we were flying. And so knowing where those were and having a, a published procedure that will keep you safe through that is a really good resource. And all this stuff is available for free. If you're on four flight, you can access it that way. It's available online. You don't have to buy those those books that you're only going to use once if if you're a VFR pilot. Um, and, and another point here too is uh, your instrument rating really does uh, kind of avail you to all the resources, all the published textual resources that the, the FAA and other agencies publish and put out for us. Um, it, it requires you to understand how to read them and interpret them, but also lets you know just how much great stuff is out there that as a VFR pilot, I would probably, I never knew about, but would be very useful for a VFR pilot. And in fact, it's a great, great point. These the uh, departure procedures are something again that work with an instructor so you can learn how to use them, uh, and they're available. Like like I said, using an EFB, but AOPA's airport directory, you can yeah. go on there and you can get them off of there and just print them out before your flight. So really useful. All right, Steve, let's go to the next slide. So. The number five oh, reason yeah. out of seven, so we'll make sure we keep going just to stay on time here, um, electronic fluency. And so we've talked a little bit about, we've mentioned things like electronic flight bags, like Four Flight or uh, Jeppesons, uh, um, uh, they've got one as well, and you know, whatever one you may be using. Um, 
you will get really good at using your GPS, learning how to really understand your avionics, the VOR, like we mentioned too, and how to interpret it and using your EFB. So if, if it's something where you're kind of like you half know, like you kind of just know direct to, doing an instrument rating will make you very fluent in how to use all these avionics and getting way more out of them. Do you want to share just your experience, Drew? I know you were working with the uh, Garmin, that was a GTN uh, 650, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah. So that was what the airplane I was flying was equipped with. And and yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time, I, I downloaded the Garmin app on my iPad and I was just running through simulations like that just to make sure I knew how to do everything. And I, I, I definitely had to demonstrate a lot of, of currency with it on my, on the check ride. And of course your examiner picks just the worst time to ask you to find something or demonstrate something on that, on that uh, GPS. Um, and another thing too, is you, you want to make sure that you kind of start from the ground up with your navigation. So um, one thing that I recommend is actually maybe printing out the approach plates. I did that when I was flying the simulator a lot so that I had no way of tracking my position on the plates. I would just, I would, so not having geo-reference plates, um, you probably won't get that on your check ride, honestly. The, my, my, my DP disabled all that, so I didn't have any, any geo-referencing uh, on the plates or the charts or anything. Um, so knowing how to use what's in your, uh, in your flight deck to, um, to, to navigate will be very helpful. And then, once you get that additional stuff, it's like, oh, this is such a luxury. Just, just like with the autopilot, every every little uh, addition of automation can be such a nice thing. But um, just trust but verify, basically. Right, and that's and the biggest thing. Two things you said there too. That I think they're really good, Drew. Number one is using your home sim is unbelievably useful, oh, yeah. not only for doing your instrument training, but actually for maintaining proficiency later. It's it's free. It's just your time that you're spending at home, and you can maintain proficiency doing that. And, and then the other part you mentioned too is that it's like, and in fact, we're going to be doing a, a check ride webinar, uh, check flight check ride webinar coming up uh, early next year. And one of the things that one of the big points we'll make is you should learn how to do it in the worst case scenario and maintain that proficiency because then when you have all these other things, it makes it simple and easy. All right, I think we're ready for the next slide, Stephen. Number six, I believe. Oh, I got a poll. What right. causes you the most concern? Is it talking to ATC? Go ahead and roll the poll, Stephen. Talking to ATC. Is it worrying about busting airspace? Is it maybe you're most concerned about like landing hard by accident or inadvertently flying into the clouds? Let's see what people think. What do you guys think, uh, Drew? Hmm. Pablo? You know, so so I guess because I do like to fly at night, um, for me, it would be inadvertently flying into clouds. Okay. You know, because th those are, th that is probably the one thing that I'm, I'm constantly scanning for and that night when it got kind of above the clouds there with no moon i was like i won't even know if i'm in the clouds probably at some point right so so i ugh, so it, i think that's probably it for me <laughs> well okay, right. true. yeah for, for me i mean uh especially flying around dc it's definitely it's uh accidentally busting airspace and uh I feel like a lot of pilots around here subscribe to the AOPA's pilot protection services just in case you <laughs> you miss one little thing and you you bust a TFR you didn't know was there or something. So I, I'm very very aware and concerned about busting airspace for sure. <laughs> and I've got Maybe friends, that, like, NASA I have friends that have been intercepted. So it's you know it it does cool. happen and it's yeah it's it's real. And I um I was just talking to a, another flying club member. He's in the he's flies off Andrew Air, Andrews Air Force Base. And he was like, you'd be surprised how many times they scramble fighters from Andrews to intercept someone who either is uh, illegally flying in the airspace or busting the airspace in some way around DC. So it happens, you, you want to take that very seriously. Cool, let's go ahead. I think the poll looks pretty good here, Steve. Let's go ahead and see what our results are. And check that out, look at that, you guys. The number one reason is busting airspace. Um, and and the, there you go on the inadvertently flying into clouds. So the two things that Pablo and Drew just mentioned, and I would agree that I think people are probably concerned about the airspace part, because of course we can't necessarily see it. It's something that we have to, to visually know where we are. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide here, because if your number one worry is busting airspace, have we got something for you with an instrument rating? <laughs> you can de-stress airspace and air traffic control right here, because the cool thing is that when you're flying on an instrument clearance, you don't have to worry so much about airspace because they're going to clear you through. You're automatically cleared into Bravo. Um, even if they route you through a, a restricted area, you can always verify and check, but it's like they're doing it because they are, are they are watching you and giving you these clearances through the stuff. Um, and so you're good to go. So it's the ATC is the, is the routing responsibility there. Um, and so, you know, just keep track of where you are. Now, the one warning here that I want to give you to really be careful is that a lot of folks will 
will be flying on an instrument flight plan. They'll use it to get through busy airspace just to make it easy. And then they'll have their destination in sight. And they'll say, you know what, ATC is really busy. I don't want to block up the airspace. So I'm going to cancel my IFR and just continue. I've got the airport in sight. I'm just going to land. You need to be careful because if you cancel IFR and you're in some other airspace that you would not normally be VFR, that could potentially be an issue. So make sure you know where, what the cloud clearances are, what the whatever oh, yeah. it might be. Make sure you know what airspace you're going to be in before you cancel your IFR. Go ahead, Drew, do you, you got a comment there with that? or? Well, no, yeah, just that that's going to come up on your check ride, and it's, it, that is a very real thing is knowing exactly what the cloud clearances are because, I mean, guess what? If you're flying instruments, you probably are going to be flying in some kind of cloud uh, a decent bit of the time. So knowing where you can actually be and be legal is, is very important. Um, and, and, yes, that, that, that confidence and also, the again, the added precision and – your confidence on the radio, you sound like you, you're someone who knows what they're doing and can, if a, if a controller gives you a vector or, or anything, even as a VFR pilot, if you if you show them that you are going to be predictable, basically, I think instrument rating, the instrument training and instrument rating really helps you kind of like know what's expected of you and, and be able to, to fly that. Cool. That's it's, it's good advice. So just make sure. And then the other point I made here was that it's like you're going to get really good at ATC services and you get priority. The nice thing, too, where it's like sometimes it might be busy and they're going to say you got to stay clear of the airspace with an instrument rating or an instrument clearance. You're likely going to go through. But I will. One other thing that I'll tell you, the experience that I happen is I used to when I was flying in Arizona, I was uh, it was Thanksgiving the night before Thanksgiving. It got really busy. And so I was trying to get my instrument clearance out of I was down at um, I'm trying to think down at. Oh, I forget now the airport, I have to come back to me later. But anyway, I was down in Southern Arizona. I was trying to go back to Phoenix and they said, well, there's an indefinite hole for instrument clearances because we are so busy. So at that point I was like, it's Arizona. It was very rarely um, uh, IFR. And so I just took off VFR and just took my chances. I'm like, well, the worst yeah. thing they'll do is I'll land at one of the deltas around and then they'll come get the truck and bring me get the packages from me. But anyway, yeah. all right, go ahead. <laughs> there's nothing worse than being stuck on the ground waiting for a clearance when you're paying on hops time. So exactly. One nice thing about flying clubs is you're paying tack time most of the time, so you have to worry about that. <laughs> Brought to you by AOPA's Flying Club Initiative. All right, so right. let's go ahead at number number seven, our last one. If six wasn't enough, we have one more good reason, and that is practical weather skills. So, you know, you might think you're pretty good at reading your weather charts, but when you're dealing with actually flying into the weather and all that, you're going to get really good at interpreting because now it becomes even more critical because now not only are you maybe flying around them, you're going to be flying off and through um, clouds and other types of weather. So your, your proficiency and understanding of weather theory and how to use the charts to interpret it is going to go through the roof, which can't do anything but make your hopefully make your decision making better for VFR. Drew, I know you're nodding. So tell us, like, what did you find as a freshly minted instrument pilot? What happened to your weather knowledge? Well, yeah, I definitely I, I've learned a ton more about weather than I ever knew as a as a VFR pilot. That's true, but. Um, all of you private pilots out there, you remember how you felt when you first got that ticket? The ink is still drying on your ticket. You're like, whoa, I can't believe I, I did this one and I can't believe they're letting me do all this stuff. Like it's very humbling, right? So that I feel the same way as a freshly minted instrument pilot. I've been a VFR pilot for five years and now I have this new capability to do all this crazy stuff. I'm still very humble by it. I'm still, you know, there's there's definitely the 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 temptations there to to fly down the minimum, sure, but you you really want to think about your abilities and your understanding of the environments. There's a lot of stuff out there that you've never experienced as a as an instrument pilot, or at least I certainly haven't. So um, it's it's humbling, and, and yes, these practical weather skills you you you've learned so much more because you're playing for real now. If you 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 know you, you have to pay attention to those icy air mats and and uh, turbulence and all that stuff. So think about that when you're when you're flying for sure. Absolutely. Um, now that brings us to the next slide, Stephen, which I believe is the end. So we have given you seven good ways that an instrument rating can help you become a better pilot. So I'm hoping that you're convinced that this is a really useful thing and is, it is worth the time and the um, the investment in doing it. So Pablo, do we yeah. have any questions by any chance? Yeah. So before we get to the questions, uh, it is 11.48, so we have 12 minutes left of the official time. We will go over uh, if we have to, but I do want to remind everybody of the next episode, January 14th, noon. I don't know why we always go Eastern. What's so important about Eastern? <laughs> 11 to 12 <laughs> Central Time and a fun on Earth. One Eastern. Wait, are we in balance? I know you guys like that. Great title. Uh, and that'll be moi. That'll be doing that. So um, uh, me and Stephen, <laughs> right? Anyway, it'll right. be fun. I think we'll have a, I think we'll have a good time. We can, we'll make weight fun. Oh God. Uh, okay. So we have 
tons of questions and really the most we've had in a long time. So I'm going to include, well, this one's going to be loaded. So this will take a few minutes. So this is going to cover probably about 10 people's questions. So okay. one is textbook learning, instrument written, simulator work, ground school, flight school, CFWI, IFR video, so many resources. Do you recommend a certain order to start or are they all the same? Hold on. Don't go anywhere. Uh, two is the simulator part at home simulators. Do you have a recommendation? How would you include it in your training? That kind of stuff. And three is um, what's the best way to start your IFR training? And, and that's just the, like 10 questions together and three in particular. So take it away. Can I take this one? <laughs> Wait, go. You yeah. want to show you into something? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I, I just went through it, so I, I definitely have a lot of opinions. There there are so many resources out there, and, and really it's just a matter of what works for you. I mean, everyone learns a little bit differently. Um, I definitely, the, the FAA publications, the Instrument Flying Handbook is an amazing resource. Um, I, I also use Sporties. Um, they, they, their, their ground school is outstanding. They really helped me get ready for the check ride. And I think Chris has something there on the screen. I can't quite see it. What is that, what? Chris? Oh, what is that? Oh, Wait, with, oh, I'm sorry. Did Ron I pick that up again? Yeah. It keeps, it keeps popping up. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's there's a lot of good stuff out there. It, it, again, it's just a matter of what works for you. As far as simulator stuff goes, I would say the biggest thing is make sure that you're you're making it harder for yourself in the simulator than you ever will in the airplane. You don't want to have this false confidence of like, oh, I I can fly a, an ILS down the minimums every time and never, you know, the needles never move on the simulator, but Make sure that you can transfer those those that experience to the to the airplane. So don't get false confidence from a simulator and then try and take that to an airplane is, is my biggest advice. Um, and uh, yeah, so Chris, do you have anything else you want to add about that? Yeah, so and I, I definitely agree that the, when it comes to resources, the big thing I would say is you know I would probably go and find the, the best thing to probably do is go to find the instrument instructor around you that you potentially are going to train with and ask them their advice because what you don't want to do is well you of course i always recommend rods that's that's the thing i recommend to my students but i let them also pick uh, if they've got something they really like um and so talk to your instrument instructor and find out maybe whatever system that they use start looking at that and then make sure that it's going to work for you you can get samples of these things because it's kind of a it's it's a little overwhelming to look at to have to like multiple textbooks or that sort of thing it's it's almost too much so find what maybe what your school uses and and start with that and then if you're finding that that doesn't quite meet all your needs then you can start looking at samples of other things um some people i know they said the written test I, i've always subscribed i know some people will tell you take the written test first before you start training as an instructor and, and as a teacher for a long time, I mean, I've been doing this for a while. Um, my my view on that is no, I would rather someone come and do some training first because then the written test becomes more valuable. It makes more sense if you actually understand what it is you're doing versus memorizing answers or you're just getting it enough so you can answer the question properly. I think that the written test can actually become useful to you when you understand and have to work through it with a, an understanding rather than memorizing. Um, so that's just, that's my tip on that. Um, for the sim at use, I agree that you definitely want to make sure it's a combination of the sim is great for maintaining your scan. Uh, the one thing that it misses is the pressure and the stuff with ATC and traffic. A lot of times you yeah. don't have that. I know there are services, though, that we talked about with our, our guests. Like, um, And help me remember, Pablo, I can't remember the name of the, the ATC service for the sims. Um, flight, uh, is it, that sim? Flight, Ed, that, that sim. That sim was one. And then there was the other one that our guest um, had on. It was a two-week um, two, uh, two like flight. Edge or uh, flight edge, I think it was the flight edge. So there are some out there, and you can use those where you actually have a controller. And having that controller part is something that's it's useful because it, it gives you more of that simulation of like I've got to deal with ATC and you can't just pause it and stop. So yeah. those kind of things, but those are useful. But don't get me wrong, having a home flight sim, whether it's, it's just as simple as a joystick and using X Plane or Microsoft Flight Sim, that's all I have. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Or if you go and invest in one that's an actual BATD, which can cost you thousands of dollars, you know, and I don't know that necessarily people would want to do that, but then you can actually maintain your instrument currency at home as well uh, using that. So definitely the SIM is worth whatever level it is. You know, yeah. just try to get one that so, models. Your <laughs> so, so this is funny. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pilot Edge, Pilot Edge, Pilot Edge, Pilot Edge. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's called Pilot Edge, actually. Yeah. Pilot Edge. Something like yeah, that. that. Was, and I know, and um, I know that they do things. I think it's mainly out of the West Coast, but it's worth doing it. And you might say, well, they only do the West Coast, you know. And I, I fly on the East Coast. 
while it's useful getting to know the instrument approaches around you, it's a good skill to go fly approaches you're not familiar with because it'll keep your because yep. the thing is what will happen is the same approaches you fly at your home airport, you end up memorizing them. And it's like it's not the same as briefing one that you're not familiar with. And that's what you really want to be good at. Yeah, your DP is probably yeah. going to pull up an approach plate from somewhere way out far away that you've never flown to and ask you questions about it. So, yeah, having that that ability to read and those. Not only for the check ride, but in real life, you're gonna you're not gonna be traveling to the same airports all the time. It's it's like you, you don't know what ATC like what if the airport you're going to gets socked in and you can't get in, you've got to go someplace else. That skill of being able to say, okay, now I'm going here, like you gotta be able to, to brief that approach and, and get ready for it. And I know we're going a little long here, but the, the other part of that question was how do you begin instrument training, right? So so Chris, yeah. you powered right through all your ratings, right? You got your private and then immediately got your instrument. Is that right? I did, yeah, I did my private, and then I was maybe a month or two of going out and sort of poking holes in the sky, and I decided, like, that's where I decided, like, I want to go on this sort of professional track, and then I went and did my instrument writing, and then after that, it was, like, straight through, commercial through yeah. CFI, multi, all that stuff, so, and I know you took a little more time, you've been uh, flying for a while as a VFR pilot, so. Yeah, it's, it, um, it, it's. Yeah, what are, what are your thoughts? It's tricky because like you you get comfortable, right? I mean, obviously, they're, like uh, Pablo was saying, I've, I've been the same way. I have certain flights I like to make that are long distance VFR flights, and I've canceled way more of those flights than I've ever tried to take or been able to take. So it, it, it's it's nice to have the, the rating, but at the same time, it's also kind of difficult to get yourself back up into that mindset of, of uh, training and, and check ride prep and studying for writtens and stuff. It, I mean, I, I've, I've been saying I've, I've been working on my instrument rating for probably four years of the five years I've been a private pilot. It's, I just now got around to it. So there's, there's advantages to both, I think. And one tip yeah. I was just thinking too for folks that are thinking about it is don't forget, go make sure if you think you're going to get your instrument rating and you don't have a lot of cross country time, make sure you go and log some, get that 50 nautical miles away Get that cross country time built up because you're going to need that before you you know can complete your instrument training. That'll make your instrument training cheaper if you do that. Oh yeah. And so real quick, when we were talking about those online ones, uh, if you go back, we can plug our own webinar. Uh, it was probably somewhere about ten episodes ish ago, maybe a little more, uh, closer to the beginning. Um, we had it was two straight weeks of one of them yeah. coming on, and the I want to say those were the first two, maybe. Yeah. yeah, and. He was great, and he gave all the information how they do, how they've got dedicated uh, ATC, and so that brings some of that in there. Uh, so, so it's pretty good. And again, I wouldn't just say just to go back and watch, but I mean, it was really, it was probably our our most followed of all of them. So it was, it was pretty good. Nice. Um, all right. So based on that, uh, we don't plug certain products, but pe many people are asking about certain products. Um, I explain Microsoft 2020, uh, you know, just all the flight sims that are out there, uh, including Redbirds and those. Mm -hmm. How do you think those are for IFR practice and currency? Uh, I'd say the biggest things there is it, it's it's honestly you don't need flashy graphics. You don't need to have like the most because the thing is you're when you're doing your instrument training the only thing you're looking at for me when i evaluate them is, is can i see the instruments and can i manipulate them so that's what i'm looking for i remember and it's not available anymore but asa used to make this um uh thing called i'm trying to remember the name of it now on top was theirs it was this one i used to be able to run it on an old uh laptop and take it with me like when i was when i was out on the road and stuff like that and just took it mm -hmm. i had like a small joystick or a gamepad i could use with it it was amazing and it's like it was very easy to manipulate so you don't necessarily need the latest and greatest thing it's not necessary for instrument training because the whole thing you want is it's just a, a current database of nav um, like the VORs and the GPS and that kind of stuff, and some way to manipulate that. Now, I will say that X-Plane and Microsoft Flight Sim, they've got all this stuff built into it. So you can certainly do that, but you can also use an older version too. And like Redbird as well, that's designed for that purpose. And so things like Redbird or whether it's, uh, you know, Fresca or I know Glim has one, they all these different manufacturers have them. Really, it's just go and look and maybe check out reviews and just make sure things are you know, it's within your price range and that for what you're going to be using, that it's going to be durable. So for at home use, it yeah. doesn't, it's not like it has to be made out of cast iron or anything. It's yeah. just got to, it's going to work and last, but they all are very useful for that. Just make sure that it's current when it comes to the database and it's got avionics that are available similar to what you're going to be flying in the airplane. That's probably the most useful thing. If you're, if you have a G1000 SIM and you're flying in a six pack, that's not exactly useful. But if you, you know, it's like you get something that's similar to what you're flying in the actual airplane. 
is what I would say. Okay, so uh, as always, we're getting questions, I think, more specific towards rules, regs, and things like that, and questions that uh, include regs in them. So, for example, do you recommend VFR pilots working on or considering starting the instrument writing fly as a safety pilot? I don't think that's yes. as simple as yes or no, is it? No, it's totally, totally should do that. Yes. Um, and in fact, I don't know if you did this or not, Drew, but one of the things you could do in that cross country time I mentioned is if you know of somebody else that's going to be going for their instrument rating or is working on it, you can actually, if you've gotten a little bit of training um, in how to scan and things, you can actually trade time during the cross country. So you can fly a leg where one person's under the hood and the other one's safety pilot. And then on the way back, the other person flips and you, you switch seats and then fly back. Um, as like assuming you've had some instrument training because you don't want to just go out and try to just scan on your own. Get some instructions so you're doing it properly because otherwise you're, you, may, you may just build bad habits. But that is a great way to do it because you both get to log the cross country time. You both get to log PIC and it is completely legal. We've got the stuff on our website because the way the regs read is when you're a safety pilot, you're a required crew member. You designate the safety pilot as the pilot in command. The person that's on the stick gets to log it as the sole manipulator of the controls. They get PIC. It's that you basically are getting cross country time at half price. So it's a great way. Did you do that at all, Drew, when you were doing it? I know you were flying for a while, so you may have had your time. Yeah, I mean, I definitely had a couple of experiences where I, where I was safety piloting, and I can certainly say that you should take those for a grain of salt. You can get experience with it, but don't always mimic everything you see as, as a safety pilot. True. I've seen some some sketchy stuff happen. Um, but yes, it, it is a great way to do it. And, and if you are on basic med, I would I would make sure you understand all the rules around around using that. For, for being a safety pilot, there are there are there's there's some things you should read and make sure you understand first before you do that. And one other thing I mentioned, I remember when I just got my private, it was before my instrument, and I was a safety pilot for someone. And the thing, looking back to that experience, that would have made it more useful for me is I didn't understand approach plates yet. I didn't understand all that, so I could see the airport, and he was the person was trying to describe it to me. But I think that maybe getting some basic instruction on what an approach plate is and what they're doing, because that way you can kind of watch what's happening and get a better idea, like what's an ILS or that sort of thing. You don't have to be like know how to do it yet, but having an understanding of what you're looking at on the plate, because that way you can now observe and see while you're looking for traffic. You can also be watching and, and seeing it unfold um, as a visual part of it. And I think that would be really useful too. So yes, being a safety pilot with a little bit of background so you understand what you're looking at is an incredibly yeah. useful thing. Otherwise, you're just looking for traffic. Um, which is a good so thing to service provider, you know. So strictly as an opinion, what is your opinion, not guidance, on uh, those accelerated IFR courses? You know, like in a week, come to come somewhere and we'll teach you in a week how to fly. Okay. Um, the I think that they've got their role, the advantage. And I, I can tell you, because I did an accelerated course when I did my glider rating, because I was getting frustrated with how long it would take to get it done um, in, in the normal fashion. So I went someplace and I knocked it out in four days. Um, and the advantage of that, like I, I'm going to try to make this analogy between instrument rating and the glider, is that in the glider, the advantage was it was very compact. I was able to do it quickly. It was efficient, right? Because it was like I wasn't losing time between training. The disadvantage was that I only flew and the type of weather conditions that happened to be there during mm. my couple of days of training. And here's Murphy's law. All my training was basically done in relatively calm winds. There was no wind except for the day of my check ride. So the first time I did a crosswind takeoff in a glider and landing was on my check ride. Like I didn't get to do it for practice at all. So with the instrument rating doing it compressed, the, the one disadvantage there would be you're going to miss out on those different weather days and interpreting weather and the change of season. So um, I'm not saying don't do it because I know there's definitely value there on a lot, a lot of folks. So maybe maybe my recommendation or my opinion would be is to you know try to do some instrument training, right? And maybe you do a little bit so you get some of that um, variety, and then you go finish it up by going and knocking out that. Because before you go to those those week long or two week long deals, you have to have your written test done. You've already got to have your cross country all done. So there's a lot of requirements there that have to meet. So maybe build up towards that, knowing that I'm gonna just get enough of a exposure to it so that when I go to this thing, I'll be ready. Because going into that cold, is not gonna probably work. It's gonna be too much to absorb. Yeah. Um, and then if you were to do it, maybe if you did do it compressed, then I'd say I would probably budget some time with an instructor to go around after you have your instrument ready to get some of that practical experience that you didn't get during the, um, the potentially during that other one. So I oh, know, what do you, any, any thoughts on that, Drew, there from? I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna, 
I'm not going to speak to any of the quality of training or anything, but I, I will say I was very fortunate that I got to experience actual IMC. I got to experience getting caught in the rain and seeing how quickly your v, your visibility goes from VFR to marginal at best, uh, VF, like I, IFR slash VFR. So having those experiences with an instructor next to you before you get your rating was a huge help for me and a huge confidence builder. So if you don't get that in the compressed course, like you said, with those seven days or 10 days, I would... Yes, Chris, I 100% agree. Go up with an instructor and, and get that experience before you do it by yourself. And just that said, the, the remember I talked about that the power table at the beginning, and I guess that I got that out of an instrument book. The book that I got it from and some of the best tips that I learned as an instrument instructor came from one of those compressed. It was the book was written by one of those people that does those, those two week instrument rating things or whatever. Um, and this is this book is from, you know, back in the 90s or whatever. Uh, but that I really it's like there's there's no doubt there's wisdom there the reason they can do it so quickly is because they're good at it but it's the it's that practical experience i think is the key just get that piece of it too that'll help you be a better and safer instrument pilot so i want to reiterate since we're five minutes past that we will stay on for a few more minutes answering some more questions because there's tons of them it's just picking the right <laughs> ones at this point uh, so you know thanks to everyone for being here but we will stick around to ask uh, for answering more questions so um i was going to say as long as it takes but no that that's <laughs> <laughs> Can't do it. Uh, anyway, okay. So someone says back on chart number one, precision. How sensitively do you measure the pitch setting? Some references cite a half to one bar width per degree. The ball on most AIs is thicker than the wing bar. Any thoughts on how precisely you need to read those references? So the one thing I'll tell you is, is try to go out and do this on a relatively calm day. When it's bumpy, it's going to be very difficult to get a good reading on what's stable. Um, but the other thing you want to understand is that those power settings and those pitch settings are really kind of a rule of thumb. Think of it that way, because when the weather changes, when you have differences in temperature, then that it's like it's going to get you close. It's the same way like when I fly VFR, I know that I default to if I want a VY climb in a 180 horsepower 172, I put the nose basically on the horizon or just near it. And that's going to get me pretty darn close to VY. And then what I do is I get it trimmed up with kind of a rough trim, and then I fine tune from there. The pitch and power settings do the same thing. They're going to get you close, and then you may have to make small adjustments from there. So to go out on a calm day, get them as close as you can, get it to where it's consistent so you know that this half a ball or a quarter ball or the line, or depending on whatever it is you have in a digital display, it's gonna be degrees, it's three degrees. Um, it's gonna get you really close and it works and then just be prepared to say, boom, 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 here I am and then I'll make, and then the fine tuning after that is gonna be little. It's gonna be little trim adjustments and things like that to, to sort of dial it in. And then what you'll learn to do is you'll make, you'll learn to make mental notes of, okay, today, it's three and a half degrees or four degrees, or it's this, it's this power setting today, because they will change depending on the weather conditions. But um, having that start, that mindset of I've had my six settings, I know what's gonna get me close, and then I make my little fine tunes, makes your flying so much easier. It takes all this, the, the like a lot of the variables away of like screwing around with the throttle and everything else. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. It makes it so much more difficult. All right, cool. Um, all right, so here's a good one. What's the biggest common mistake, in your opinion, a private makes when starting instrument training? The biggest common Drew, mistake. Drew, you're you're fairly new to this. Maybe yeah, you've got something. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Mm-hmm. Do you think of a mistake maybe that you made that you may not have the the purview um, to think about? But the biggest common mistake. I don't make a lot of mistakes, so this is tough. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's what uh, I was gonna say. I, I don't remember ever. No. Um. Mistake. Wow, the, the the most common mistake for for me it was for me I, I had trouble at first intercepting courses. So if you're if you're flying in a hole or something, intercepting that outbound course, I would I would tend to like inch my way to it. Like say this is the course, I would just kind of like slowly come into it. When you really want to have like a, a a set intercept angle, fly that, find the course because I was always so afraid I was going to overshoot and have to like chase it back in. So like just like being able to consistently and confidently intercept and track a course was probably my the biggest thing I struggled with. Hmm. That's interesting. That gives me another idea for a webinar, Pablo, which is we could give tips on how to do intercepting. I've got all kinds of little tricks and things we could we could share a bunch of that kind of stuff. I would honestly I I want to take a bigger view on that because it's not necessarily one mistake because I could think of a lot of things. I I know all along the way in instrument training I've learned. 
like things that I sort of head off at the past. Like I've learned enough <clears> where as an instructor that I go, okay, I'm going to explain it to you this way and there's a reason for it. And so I would say that the biggest mistake that private pilots make is not is twofold. It's number one, not trusting the method that your instructor is teaching you. Like not believe, when we say believe your instruments, they don't always believe us, right? And so there's ways that I teach them, like believe me to believe your instruments. And like, here's the way you should scan. And there's a reason that I'm telling you to scan this way. And so they, they'll, they'll often wanna just kind of do their own thing. And then it's like, I, what I do is I cover instruments up and I do all kinds of things to force you to do the scan. And then once they get it, they're like, oh, this is a lot easier. I'm like, I know, this is why I'm telling you this. Um, and so there's that. And then the other part is the, the other thing is make sure uh, I know from my own experience as a student going through it and then working with people is make sure you ask when you don't understand something. So it's like I think that's a big error people make, too, is they just take whatever the instructor says and says, well, I must I guess I'm supposed to understand this and they don't really understand it. And so challenge, not even challenge your instructor, just ask your instructor and, you know, make them earn their money in the sense of like, I don't get it. And so it's like you may need it's like and maybe your instructor doesn't have a way to teach it to you then if you really don't get something then ask for help because when you when the light bulb goes off and you understand whatever it's vor or whatever it might be doing adf or that kind of stuff then it's all of a sudden you're like holy crap why, did, why didn't i see that before and now i get it and it's so much easier so the, know, two, the other thing too though Wait, go ahead. the chris echoes for basically being a pilot though right i mean you can't yes. just blindly follow along on, on either atc your instructor maybe yep. some pilot next to you uh, safety pilot. I mean, that's the whole point of these things is your PIC. And yep. so even when the instructor's next to you, you're not sitting there going, <laughs> he's going to tell me what to do next, right? No, you're flying the plane, right? And yeah. so and, and for whatever reason, it just popped into my head. This happened. It's not instrument based, but I was taxiing off of uh, active runway. ATC told me, you know, direct to uh, Travel Express as I'm going, you know, across uh, Alpha to Bravo or whatever. And so I get there and I see a tail dragger coming and he's like cleared across. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't understand how that could be. I, I was like, and so I stopped because you're cleared across. And he said, but there's a tail dragger and I can't see me, you know, because it would come, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> you know, and so they're like, oh, you know, we missed it. I, I mean, imagine, imagine if I'm just like, oh, okay, I see the plane, but he told me to cross. So it's okay to cross. Yeah. I mean, that goes for PIC, man, you're in command here. And PSC, and you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. And then the other sort of the other uh, flip of that or whatever is what I'm getting at, too, is that when your instructor is describing a concept, I know for me, for like VORs, like I went through my instrument rating, he described it to me. I didn't really get it, but I just thought, well, I, I guess I'm supposed to get it. And I sort of struggled through it. It wasn't until later that the light bulb went off. And now I'm like, I get them like VORs are not that difficult once you are taught the right way to, to, to get your mind around it. And of course, oh, yeah. now we've got tools that I didn't have, like Sims and everything else makes it so much easier to get it. And so that's what I'm getting at is it's like, if you're going through and your instructor is teaching you something and you don't get it, stop them and say, I need help. I don't get this. And in fact, I literally just had that with the person that I'm working with now, that compass turns. It's like, it's like they weren't quite getting it. And so we had to, it's, and it's for me, that's part of the fun of being an instructor is that, is that puzzle of like, well, what, do, what am I not telling you that, will help you get this. And so I need that feedback. I need you to tell me I don't get it yet. Like I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. And so then I can helps me ask questions or you just gotta you just gotta say to your instructor, I don't get this. And 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 if need be, a good instructor is not gonna have a problem with saying, well, let's go see if we can find somebody else that maybe can explain it in a different way to help. So take over it's almost like being PIC of your own learning is what I'm getting at, Pablo, <laughs> is that yeah. take charge of your learning and make sure you understand. Don't assume, don't feel bad if you don't get it. Your instructor's right. job is to help you get it. So don't, and if the instructor right. makes you feel bad, get a new instructor, because that's ridiculous. Yes. So. Yep. Well, um, the questions continue. Uh, I'd like <laughs> to go forever, but I think, I, and, and it's funny, because I had one here I was going to ask, and I didn't do my usual procedure, so I don't, I lost it. Oh, you lost so it, I'll yeah, that happens. <laughs> I'll go to another one. Um, so, and this will be the last one. So. Um, I live in Minnesota where clouds are often at freezing level. How practical is an IFR rating to punch through the clouds in a simple GA airplane in my club that does not have de-icing capabilities? First of all, great that you're in a club. That's awesome. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that is <laughs> our guest. It's the last question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, so even here in Maryland, we definitely get all the seasons. So there are 
there's thunderstorms in the winter or in the summer there's icing in the winter so there's there's definitely a it's it's not the be all end all to get you where you need to go all the time in the small airplane there's just no way um so uh, yeah if there's if there's a lot of ice and stuff i i, I wouldn't want to do that i wouldn't because like the the icing is the worst as you get to the top of the cloud so you could you could fly through most of the cloud and probably and maybe be okay but then that last little bit you pick up a ton of ice i mean then, then what do you do you fly through an isolating you have to fly back down through an isolating cloud to get back out of it so i i don't know that's what do you think chris you probably have some some real world experience with icing right i do um and so that's the thing, and, and I agree, you don't want to mess with icing. And so the, the question being, it's like, if would, is it not worth having it because you deal with icing all the time? I don't know that I'd agree with that, just for the, all the reasons that we already mentioned, the precision, the night flying, the better understanding of ATC. There's so many other reasons where an instrument rating will help you, even if that you may not be able to fly in the winter. And I, I've been up in uh, Wisconsin in the summer, and so I know that you do get weather that's not icing weather. And so it would be really useful there. Um, and for that kind of weather, um, but, you know, I guess you'll you have to, to weigh that out. But I do think that the the safety and the knowledge yeah. that you will gain, the decision making probably is still worth it, even if you can't use it during the winter so much. Um, and, I, and I will make that an emphasis. Do not mess with icing. Um, the two times I, I've gotten when I was flying, doing the freight stuff, it's like I got myself. It was, it was when I was early on flying the Piper Lance and I got myself an icing twice and I got out of it right away. But those were the times when I really learned to exert piloting command authority because ATC was not listening to me. And I was like, I am not doing this because I could see it picking up. I'm getting out of it. And I was in Arizona. So it was like it wasn't like we had it wasn't like I was on the coast with these huge layers. But you know, don't mess with ice because it's this. You see the accidents that happen. It's just it's just not smart. So don't do it. Now, I did fly an ice later because I was flying a Piper Chieftain and a, Piper, and a, uh, a Beach 99, and those things were certified for that. And so I was able to go up and down through it. So maybe at some point, um, hey, you climb a lot better too. They can handle it. Fly faster and yeah. climb better. So you're, yeah, it's a different, exactly. different animal. And they could potentially handle it. So yeah, yeah um, I don't have a, a set answer for you, but I still think it's worthwhile. And, and yeah. from a from a club perspective, real quick too, like in in, in general too, you're going to pay less for insurance if you're instrument rated. Insurance companies like to see pilots in clubs and pilots owning and operating airplanes that have their instrument rating. So it'll it'll be it'll be favorable in a lot more ways than just the actual flying. True, I love it. You just gave us our bonus number eight reason to get your <laughs> instrument right. rating: lower insurance. <laughs> That's right. And and that's and that's the beauty of sticking around for the Q&A. You often get bonuses. So, uh, OK, so, uh, you know, we do have to cut it off at some point. And I think at this point we're 1216 uh, central time. 117 so Eastern. Yeah, so we will we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us again. We've had some great comments and great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. To round it all up, button it all up, we've had a lot of questions about the recording, about attaching documents, attaching Thanks. presentation, attaching all this stuff. So we will put all of that stuff into um, into that link. So when you go watch it, it'll all be on that, right? Uh, Steven? Can we do that on the link? Um, IT told me it's possible, so yeah. Okay, then maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe we can try to, we'll look at the email as well if need, but we can send out the, yes. I can easily make a PDF of both these things. and Absolutely. And, uh, so yeah. yeah, and it's more than that, Chris. We've actually had requests for a lot of things in your webinar today, so um, okay. so that's good. Uh, also, remember uh, I mentioned it before January fourteenth. Wait, are we in balance? <laughs> uh, and that'll be that'll be so exciting. I think it'll be a great lunchtime meal for everybody. So uh, thank you. Off. Yeah, <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. Stephen, fly us out of here. All okay, righty. Thanks, thanks everybody. See you guys.